if this idea is correct or not. So she took um, some water and made it up to have about the same composition as the natural water we find in Zimapan. And she added arsenic to it. So it was it had arsenic concentrations of 0 0.6 milligrams per liter, approximately. And this she called experimentally contaminated water, just so you can know the acronyms, experimentally contaminated water. And she did an experiment with that. So she put water in a beaker, her experimentally contaminated water in a beaker with a rock called Las Espinas, which is the top layer uh, in town of the rock. It's, a, it's a, from a volcano. And she discovered that the pH changed a little bit. The arsenic concentration went down, but it didn't go down below the drinking water limit. Anytime, however, in her experiments that she took water and reacted it with the Soyatan formation, the concentration of arsenic went down below our detection limit and below the drinking water limit. So it seems as though if the arsenic, if the water, <coughs> excuse me, goes through the soil health formation, something there takes the arsenic out of the water. That's good news. So what does the soil health formation look like? There it is. You can see there are two types of rocks in this formation. There are these rocks that are chunky, big, and hard. And there's rocks in between that have a lot of clay in them, a lot of uh, very small particles. And to get a better, a better look, when we analyzed this rock, it was mostly limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And therefore, the, the mineral that occurred most frequently was calcite, which is also calcium carbonate, uh, 70 to 80 percent. And quartz, silicon dioxide, was about 20 to 30 percent. And there were some clay minerals, which are potassium, calcium, sodium, aluminum, and silica, is, is what those are composed of. But not much in terms of clay minerals. When we looked at the other part of the soil top, which is really, it's dirty feeling, it looks ugly, you know. Um, it had mostly quartz, the silicon dioxide, a little bit of calcite, calcium carbonate, lots and lots of clay minerals, the potassium, calcium, sodium, aluminum silicate. So now we, now we have another thing to think about of what is it in the soil valve that takes out the arsenic. So, all right, um, this is a little out of sequence, but um, we'll work with it. One of the geochemical things we did to um, understand what was happening here is we took all the water samples that we analyzed and we made a plot of pH, so how acidic it was, with EH on the y-axis, that's oxidation reduction potential. So if the value was high, that means that it's an oxidizing solution, so there might be lots of oxygen in it or other things that would oxidize other minerals and for instance make the iron change from plus two to plus three. And if it was low, it meant it was reducing conditions with not much oxygen in it at all. So we found that the contaminated wells were more reducing than a lot of the surface water. And we found that the ore process water so this is the water that was used to push the tailings out into those piles because they combined it with water and just piped it out.
that had a fairly high pH compared to other things. So we're thinking all of this stuff. The reason we had to worry about that is we were trying to test the soil tile formation to see um, how we could get the arsenic out of the water. What we found was that if we combined, say, 10 grams of, of rock, uh, 10 kil, oh, sorry. This goes, oh, this is a solid. If we had the rock water ratio of 1 to 10, so 1 gram of rock to 10, 10 grams of water, that we could remove more than 80% of the arsenic in the rock. If we had concentrations where we had um, much uh, more dilute solutions, that that wouldn't work. So we need to have the rock somewhat concentrated, but we didn't need to make it, you know, one kilogram of rock and one kilogram of water. I also found information in the literature that clay minerals absorbed arsenic. So what we see here is this is for the clay mineral called uh, kaolinite. That absorbs arsenic pretty well up to about a pH of 6 or 7. It drops off significantly when you get higher pH. And there's also a mineral called illite which has iron in it, by the way, that can absorb arsenic fairly well at the neutral pHs as well. So this was our hypothesis, that we had clays in the soil tile formation that would absorb the arsenic from the water. So we started thinking, how, how can we use this? Um, and we came up with, um, we continued those experiments to see uh, what if we started with a different concentrations, what the concentration limitations were. And it turned out that we thought that if you did not have the municipal water supply, which had too much arsenic anyway, so you could do this if you had it, the, the people in Zima Pond are very, very poor. Um, but if they could get a bucket, and some of the rock, the right kind of rock. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, then we could mix the rock with the water, and we could filter out the rock pieces, the silk afterwards, <coughs> through blue jeans. We tried other materials that didn't work as well. Then I'll spend my last 15 minutes coughing. <clears throat> then you could make water in your kitchen that didn't have arsenic in it. And uh, my daughter, that's a picture of my daughter Margaret there. She helped with these experiments when she was in high school for the bit. She actually tried drinking the water after it had been mixed with the rock and then filtered out. And she said that if we used 20 liters of, of water and 2 kilograms of rock, that that was okay, but any more rock made the water taste too salty. So it should be a good um, quality control check. So the problem then is, okay, who's, gonna, who's going to uh, think that taking your water and mixing it with dirty rock is going to provide you with something acceptable to drink. So, you know, that's like a, uh, an academic thing saying, oh yeah, this could happen. But it really would be better to find a water source that didn't have arsenic in it because very few people would want to drink water that had dirt mixed in it. Would you? Not really, not really. Um, so I need to skip a few slides here. 
So, so then our next step was to say, okay, let's find a place in the Zimapan Valley that has clean water. That's the better thing to do. And if we can drill a water well where there's clean water, then we don't have to worry about how to get the water out of the system. So this required that we do a computer model. So the research was not only going to Mexico and collecting rock and soil and water samples and analyzing them, but it was also just an intellectual exercise, thinking with the assistance of a computer. So one of my students took the Zimapan Valley. There's a big, what we call a fault system here, which is where the rock breaks. And this fault was two meters wide. So we were very sure that there was a lot of water being able to travel along that fault because it was so big. And this was at a higher elevation than the town is. So water goes downhill, right? So if it starts at a high elevation, it'll go down through town to the low point uh, along the river, which was right in through here. So my student Peter worked on that. That's Peter there. We also noticed that um, many people in Simapan had gardens, and they would use water, uncontaminated water from the surface that they pumped up to um, water their gardens, which was sort of artificial rainfall, because they didn't get enough rain to maintain their gardens, so they used well water. So there was some artificial rainfall on there that we worked into the model of mass balances of water. How much water is coming in, how much water is going out, how much arsenic is there, so where is your concentration uh, good? And this is the, the concept behind Peter's model, that we had the fault to the north the, where the water potential was high, the elevation was high. We had the river down to the south, where it was low. And then in the middle, in this pink area, some people were watering their gardens, so that added water to the system. When we put this all together, along with the data that we had, we found that um, that was where we really you know, we're able to verify that we should have the uncontaminated water to the east. There was a zone of uncontaminated water in the central area, but all of the water to the west would be contaminated. And these brown spots here are the various hollows uh, that could provide arsenic to the shallow groundwater system. It turned out there was a water source in the middle of town that we did not have access to because the city wouldn't let us take a sample there, but there was this tree that they actually named El Sabino. The Sabino is a type of tree it was, but this was the Sabino. And um, this tree was as, oh, as big around in diameter as the stage is long, so it's a huge tree. And these grow, these grow near significant water sources. So there might actually be a source in town that they had not drilled uh, that they could get clean water at. So, um, for conclusions, the, uh, some of the water that was um, brought into town from outside of town was used to irrigate, to make water for the gardens. And that could be a source to help dilute the arsenic um, in the water systems ahead of some time. There were a couple of areas where they had not drilled water wells, but we thought that they could. There was one eastern area that did not have any municipal wells in it that should be a good source of clean water. And the area around the big tree was probably also another source. And if they couldn't find any unpolluted water as a last resort, Maybe they could think of a way to use the soil tile formation to clean up the water that there was. This work was done um, about 10 years ago, we finished it. And since then, the government has decided to put a pipeline into Zima Pond 
entering water in from about uh, 16 kilometers away, and that was their solution to improving the water quality in the park. So I thank you for your attention, and um, I guess we'll, we'll move on. I think I've used all my time. I will request Rasel Pokran, J. Prop, UK Trail Curriculum and Training, to deliver this speech. Today, we're very excited to see you all. Um, I actually am not going to speak to you for very long because I actually am here today to ask you to help me. So, um, I am here with Chemists Without Borders, and part of our work here is to help establish an environmental science program. Um, and help your faculty here and your administration figure out what that program should look like. And in order to do that, we think it's very important that we understand what student needs are and students' thoughts and feelings are about what they would like. So I'm asking you to help me by filling out a fairly short survey. It's front and back, and there are questions. Um, Please answer the questions you would like to answer and leave the ones that you're not comfortable answering or, or don't necessarily have anything to say. Um, if you have questions about, about how to understand how you're supposed to respond, please ask some of the faculty around. I know that they could, they could probably help you understand the English better than I could. Um, there are 50 of these and there are probably more than 50 of you here. So. Uh, you can pair up and help each other, or um, give me some responses so that we can we can help you make your program better. And I have pens also that you can keep after you finish. These are um, pens that our organization uh, uh, uses because they're polylactic acid plastic. So the plastic is made from corn, and it's completely biodegradable. You understand this word biodegradable? So if you bury it in the soil, it will go away after about nine months. So these are corn pens, and um, keep them, please. If I could get some help passing these out to somebody. Yes. Okay. The question that you are getting, mainly for the students, they are very easy, you will be able to understand them. But still, I'm going to explain to you. How old are you? Do you own a cell phone? I use my cell phone to make phone calls, send me text messages, browse the internet, other free that's played. Do you use any of the following? Check that all the required. Email, Facebook, Twitter, other social media. What do you hope to get out of it? If you are telling people outside Bangladesh about the strengths of the country, what do you tell them? What strength do you have in Bangladesh? If you are telling people outside Bangladesh about the weaknesses of their country, what do you tell them? What do you consider to be the biggest environmental concern facing Bangladesh? Practically, I was a threat, but boy, she does not take all of the time. What do you consider? the greatest environmental concern facing the world. Please fill up the form, answer the questions in 10 to 15 minutes and give them back. Ekonikoro, you are also given a paper and a pen. Pen of the hour. Now I will request the chair from Sir Dr. Goramani to carry back.
Now I request, I would request Dr. Bola Malikoki, BC, Java, Bangladesh University to deliver this speech. And this is Richard Pokhran. Colleagues, and dear students, Assalamu alaikum. Well, in fact, uh, I could speak last and we could give time to the audience to interrupt. But I feel that after I talk, I try to give some information about Bangladesh and international setting. I think I think that there is a discussion of reliability. That is why I am speaking to you. First, I like to thank very much to Moses Abangale for her presentation on arsenic problems of jump and Thali at Mexico. I think it's a very good study and intensive study she made and she put together the lots of helium information which will be useful not only for USA or Mexico or other countries affected with arsenic. Well, I would like to give some impression about what is happening as regards to arsenic technologies. Dr. Ignamul has mentioned that our 59 countries, 59 states out of 64. In fact, now this is there are 62 districts out of 64 districts of Bangladesh are affected by Assam. And this is the worst affected country as regards to Assam. If we consider the area affected by Assam, it will be it will be 1,026,134 1, square kilometer out of the total country that is four fifth of the area of Bangladesh is affected by arsenic contamination of our human body. And 75 million people are at risk. And 24 million people are potentially exposed to arsenic contamination. Lots of research have been conducted on arsenic pollution or arsenic contamination by the government as well as by the international agencies. World Bank has taken a great deal of interest for arsenic problem and people uh, experts from MIT USA as well as from Japan and European countries have taken part in conducting research and millions and millions US dollars have been spent for solving the arsenic problem of Bangladesh. But we will try to see what is the what are the Here also the arsenopyrite is the compound which releases arsenic in the drinking water. It is the fact is here different from Mexico. Here due to extraction of great amount of surface water, I think this accumulation of arsenic occurs in the And it, it occurs in three different combinations with oxygen, arsenic oxide, ASO, ASO2, ASO3 ASO in three different bondage with oxygen. 
I think there is measure, there is there is a uh, uh, technique for identification of arsenic. I think now the kids are available everywhere. Okay. The Swiss made one is working the most in the country. In the regard that the chemist without border.